It's biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me. Hello, everyone. So this is a relatively quick YouTube lesson. I say lesson. I'm going over a couple of tasks that are in the booklet, task 16, 17. But I also, just before I do that, there is one of my groups, 12A. You've not had the opportunity to look at this last part of the PowerPoint. I didn't, I didn't get round to it with you. But it's also a, a nice little reminder about things to do with ECG and uh, conditions like tachycardia, bradycardia, and um, yeah, atrial fibrillation, fibrillation in general, and what they can look like on an ECG. So this was for this is 12A, you've not seen this before. It was linked to these, these sort of patients that we had originally in last week's YouTube lesson. So spot the difference. What's going on there? Pause me so you can think. What is the difference about those? Are there any differences in the P, Q, R, S and T waves? Where's the difference? Okay. Now, if you actually look at Cormac, he's got a nice P wave, atrial uh, systole, atrial contraction. He's got a nice Q, R, S wave, which is ventricle. Uh, he's also got a very nice T wave, showing diastole. The only difference is the gap between this T wave and the subsequent P wave of the next cardiac cycle is much shorter compared to this normal sinus rhythm, the normal heart rhythm, about 72 beats per minute. So the actual only thing going on with Cormac is that he's got a high heart rate. He has more heart rates, a great number of heartbeats in the same time period as the normal sinus rhythm. So a fast heart rate, it is a condition, and it's known as tachycardia. Mark Kalman was the second patient on, on that list. So again, you're now looking at uh, what the difference is between his and the normal one. The only thing I will state, which makes it a little bit odd, uh, you're not looking at tachycardia necessarily again. Uh, this isn't necessarily showing the same time window. Okie doke. Now, if I look at marks, the only thing, this is the answer, the only thing I can see which looks normal is the QRS. The QRS, uh, the, vent the ventricle contraction part of it, looks absolutely normal. I cannot make out a clear P wave for atrial uh, contraction. I cannot make out a clear T wave to show uh, ventricular diastole. So the issue actually here, it, it's never going to be, it's never going to be the T wave, it's never going to be the diastole. The issue here is... Mark Kalman's atria is contracting multiple times for every contraction of his ventricle, where it should be a one-to-one -one rela relationship, one atrial contraction followed by one ventricular contraction. But Mark Kalman has many. He has no clear P waves. The atria are therefore beating more frequently than the ventricles. He has an irregular heartbeat, and we call irregular heartbeats fibrillation fibrillation. So that, because it's the atria, that's being a bit weird, is atrial fibrillation. If you had the same thing, but you had like a clear P wave, but then there was like no clear QRS, so there was like, there was like loads of them all together, you didn't know which one was which, that would be ventricular fibrillation. The uncoordinated contraction of the atria. And quite often, atrial fibrillation is an example of tachycardia. The atria is contracting too fast, therefore an example of tachycardia, the one we saw before. There was a third patient. That's just clarifying atrial fibrillation. There was a third patient. That was Ted. Bless him. Ted. You are looking at the same timestamp there. Okay, here's your answer. Uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with Ted's PQRS and T waves. Absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever. However, the gap between his T wave and the next P wave, where it's so long I can't even see it. Ted's heart rate is too slow. There's a fewer number of heartbeats than were observed in the same time period as the normal sinus rhythm. And a slow heart rate is known as bradycardia, bradycardia. Okay, so the couple of tasks that I set in the booklets, here we go, I'm gonna get my tablet as well so I can write. We're beginning on task 16 with the title electrocardiograms and there was a little task underneath task 17 uh, where you could uh, go over with just a, a couple of a couple of nice little questions to do with ECGs. Um, 
There is a task after that, task 18 as well, which is not to do with ECGs, but it's, it's, it's a quick one, so I may as well go through it whilst I'm here. And then, uh, then the booklet is more or less done now, well, at least out the things that I've set you. So here goes. Now, what you're actually asking for this one is, um, rather than what is bradycardia, what is or what does ECG look like, it's, it's asking for the causes of them. So for bradycardia, what is causing that slow heart rate? Tachy, what's causing the high heart rate? Atrial fibrillation, what's cause, causing an uncoordinated beating of the atria? An ectopic heartbeat, that's when your heart skips the beat. So what can cause a, a, a skip? Just imagine like a, the, uh, the ECG for ectopic heartbeat. It's going along normally, and then there just isn't a heartbeat. Or it's going along normally, and then there's just two right next to each other, and then back to a normal rhythm. That would be ectopic. So it's not all the time, it's just every now and again there's this like additional heartbeat or removal of a heartbeat that should have been there. So if it were me, and I don't you probably might already have this in your notes, if it's me, I'd make it very, very clear on a single side of A4 what the ECGs of these four conditions look like compared to the normal rhythm. And then almost annotating around that, you could put like sort of causes behind that. But the most important thing for you guys is to appreciate what the ECG would look like for these conditions. That's the biggest takeaway for your A-level. So, bradycardia. This by a tablet was running at a bit of a lag just earlier, so we'll see how this goes. Now, for your heart rate to be going really, really slowly, it may be as simple as a cause could be that you've damaged and this could be by infection, the heart tissue. I said there was a lag. Let's see this. Let's let's generally see how long it takes. There it is. <laughs> so I'm just I'm gonna keep writing and talking. And hopefully it will catch up with me eventually. <laughs> I'm just going to limit how much I write. Uh, so yeah, bradycardia. It, might be, it could be as simple as slow heartbeat because you've damaged the heart tissue. So maybe like the electrical conductions don't uh, conduct as quick as they could. Or well, in particular, maybe you might have damaged the sinoatrial node, the actual node of the heart that causes, begins uh, all the uh, electrical waves of excitation. If you're looking for non-sort of physical injuries, uh, it could be uh, linked to an underactive uh, thyroid gland, because that would give you a low metabolism, and therefore these reactions will take place at a slower rate. Uh, and also, there are plenty of medicines which have this as a side effect, including uh, medications for high blood pressure. So if, if you've got medications which are there to lower your blood pressure, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, it may cause overall a slowing down of the heart rate. The other, see, is, see the tablet's catching up with me eventually. The last sort of thing that is potentially quite a nice one to appreciate here is, and again, this has become far more important when we do nerves in year 13. These waves of excitation rely on ions. Ions with charge. That's what gave us the idea of depolarization and repolarization. So if you have an imbalance of those ions, of those chemicals involved, in particular for heartbeats, by the way, the chemicals calcium, because that's highly involved in the contraction element of the heart, and also like the element, so the mineral ion of potassium, because that's heavily involved in the repolarization and depolarization of the heart as well. So if you've got like an imbalance, that also will affect potentially how that electrical signal might be carried. So bradycardia, when the electrical signals slow down or are blocked completely, the heart will be slower. That's bradycardia. Tachycardia, obviously it's the opposite in terms of a, of a of what is actually happening to the heart. We've got this really high heart rate. So again, why might you have a high heart rate? Well, it's unlikely to be damaged this time. Damage would might like break the electrical, it wouldn't necessarily speed up this electrical activity. 
So now we're probably into a realm of, of, okay, why would we have a higher heart rate? Well, we'd have a higher heart rate if you had higher blood pressure. So why might you need high blood? You might need higher blood pressure if you're anemic. If you're anemic, it means you have, don't have enough iron in your blood, which means you don't have enough hemoglobin. It means you can't carry as much oxygen per red blood cell. So the bodies, to compensate for that, would make the heart beat faster. Because if the heart beats faster, right, your blood might have less hemoglobin, less oxygen, but if it's getting to the cells quicker, you might still be able to supply enough to meet your metabolic demand. So people who are anemic can suffer. That is a cause of tachycardia. Other things that might affect it, we're getting to the, the world of drugs now. Um, too much alcohol can make you tachycardic. Uh, too much Caffeine can make you tachycardia. It affects all the calcium ions and all the contraction. Uh, excessive smoking, uh, stimulant drugs like cocaine and methamphetamines. You know, the stimulants for a reason, they, they will speed things up. Likewise, if an underactive thyroid gland gave bradycardia, an overactive thyroid gland might cause tachycardia. Again, overactive thyroid gland, too much thyroxine uh, as a hormone, it gives you a really, really high metabolic rate. Uh, and yeah, if you've got a high metabolic rate, you need lots of oxygen and glucose to respire. So the heart rate will have to increase to supply that. So um, some have not written down, but a cause of tachycardia is, of course, exercise as well. Why do you get a high heart rate? Just hopefully uh, when you stop exercising, it should go down back to the normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so I'm just going to actually, I'm going to delete this out, so obviously just pause this if, you, if you're writing it as I am. Atrial fibrillation is the next one. Fibrillation. I promise I am writing as it goes, it just, just doesn't like me some of the time. So atrial fibrillation, we've got the atria contracting in at completely irregularly. They're not necessarily contracting just before the ventricle, and they might be contracting multiple times before the ventricle does. Now, it's, again, the idea around damage to the heart, absolutely, it could cause this, but I'm going to focus on other aspects that might cause this over, it's basically a very overexcited atrium. So we almost link it back to tachycardia again. The atria is beating too many times, so that links to tachycardia. So the idea of having a high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, which can cause high blood pressure. If you're unsure what atherosclerosis is, that is what having too much bad cholesterol can do to you. Uh, bad cholesterol, uh, which transports around the body, something called LDLs, low density lipoproteins. It's a, it's a cool thing to look up and research if you're interested. Um, yeah, they can cause little plaques in your arteries. So those plaques obviously will block the arteries, makes the artery lumens smaller than they should be. That in turn increases the blood pressure inside those arteries and therefore can cause even more damage. So atherosclerosis, yeah, it's not, not the greatest condition. It will cause high blood pressure and therefore could cause disfibrillation. So yeah, things like heart disease obviously come into this. It could just be that the atria is diseased or damaged. Um, this is associated with an overactive thyroid gland, although you wouldn't say it's a cause, it's just association. Uh, the other one we could write down for this is pericarditis. Uh, if you didn't know, the uh, pericardium... <laughs> just hear my little girl. <laughs> she's... I'm sorry, I've got to tell you what she's doing. She's going, ah, ah, making noises, but to the tune of the Iron Man theme tune. So, I am... Iron Man. She's so cool. Uh, peri the pericardium is the lining that surrounds the fluid sac that contains the heart. So your heart isn't just there floating freely, it is encased in this sort of fluid filled sac and that sac has a lining of the pericardium if that gets infected it's called pericarditis and that infection can be a cause of that heart disease of that heart damage 
<laughs> I really hope you can hear it. It's really funny. Ectopic heartbeat. So this is the one that is um, far... There's just so many different triggers if you do look to stop of what it could be. There are... I'm not going to write them all down because it would be, be here for days. There are lifestyle triggers. So too much exercise, not enough sleep, too much caffeine, too much alcohol, too much smoking, too many illegal drugs. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Uh, even even rich and spicy food, too many curries, guys, could be a trigger to have an ectopic heartbeat. This one or sort of skipping of a beat. There are emotional triggers. So to stress, anxieties, panic attacks. There are me medicines. So side effects of certain medicines. So if you are asthmatic like myself and you take salbutamol, one of the side effects of too much use of that is an ectopic heartbeat. Uh, high, uh, tablets for high blood pressure, tablets, antidepressant tablets, uh, hormone changes. Now, I think this is very sexist because men do have significant hormone changes. Just ask Mrs. Bateson. She'll tell you that. Um, uh. But the examples that the NHS has given us for hormone changes is periods, pregnancy and menopause, because obviously only women get hormonal. Wow. Um, yeah, heart rhythm problems. So if you're someone who naturally has a heart rhythm problem, rhythm, I've spelled that wrong, haven't I? Um, either way, heart rhythm problems. So if you already had tachycardia, you already had atrial fibrillation, that is a trigger to have ectopic heartbeats as well. <coughs> And then the usual sort of medical ones, like the ones before, like an overactive thyroid gland and being anemic, they can also trigger an ectopic heartbeat. One day, my tablet, by the way, will keep up with us. It's stuck on hormone. I promise you, I have written heart rhythm problems and medical issues like overactive thyroids just below. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. It gets there eventually. <laughs> Either way. Let's go down to the, the, the first little bit of main like main questions now, task 17. So we've got a normal trace, A. Eh? We've got a trace after the drug digitalis. Oh, I know, that's the one from Foxgloves, Dr. William Withering. Um, I have a sneaky feeling it, 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 it was used as a poison because it would stop people's hearts if you gave them too much. And C is, oh, a fibrillation. So that's like the, that's all the uncontrolled... Uh, beats. I can't. I can't work out any real P waves or Q or S waves there. So that really is atrial and ventricular fibrillation. It's looking at. So with reference to trace A, so we've got to look at the top one. I'm just going to erase what I've got on here. First thing I've got to do is calculate the length of a single cycle, uh, single cardiac cycle. A single cardiac cycle is P, Q, R, S, and T all together until the next one, until the next P wave. So the length of the single cycle, it begins sort of... Okay, this is really difficult to see, isn't it? Because it's, you know, really small and a very worn copy. Uh, let's just presume it starts at just after zero, and then it ends at the start of P wave with just after 0 0.8. So I'm saying the correct answer for the length of one cardiac cycle is 0 0.8 seconds. That seems to be the unit. So 1A... 0.8 seconds. Nice. It goes from there to the start of the next P wave. That's one cardiac cycle. The number of cycles per minute. So, okay, I don't need to use the graph again. I know this one. Uh, the number of cycles per minute. Well, if one heartbeat is 0.8 seconds, well, you need to work out how many 0.8 seconds fit into 60, which is obviously one minute, 60 seconds. So all you do is 60 divided by 0.8, and that will give you answer of... In my head, 75 ish, something like that. Have you got a calculator? I'm sure you'll do it. The key thing is, I'm looking for this working, this bit here. If you didn't get 0 0.8 in your first answer, but you've like, but you've used it, let's say for whatever reason, if for your 1A, you got 0 0.9 seconds. If you've then done 60 divided by 0 0.9, and then you've written whatever that number would be, then yeah, you still get that, that second mark, guys, absolutely ever carried forward and all that. Okay, we go to the next page. With reference to trait B, trace B state two side effects of digitalis. So this really is a say what you see exercise. What is different between trace A, the normal, and trace B after the digitalis? Um, the only thing you really need to be going on about that maybe makes this a little bit 
harder from an exam technique. I'm stating two side effects. So if you just set like the, the, the T wave is, you can see the T wave for example is much longer, isn't it? You're not going to get any credit there. But if you link that to diastole, then that would that would gain you credit. So the mark scheme, bear in mind this is a 2001 mark scheme, so who actually knows how good that is. Um, oh, by the way, 2001 is one of the very first mark schemes used for biology exams. Even in the 90s, they were not using official mark schemes. Yes, how people got exam results then was literally blind luck on who the examiner was. No official mark scheme, no standardised mark schemes. How funny is that? Still, <laughs> still, I just can't believe that was still in the 90s happening. Uh, still, um, yeah, what we're looking for here is for B. Well, if you look at the entire cycle from P to P, it's now longer, isn't it, by like 0 0.1 of a second? So that is definitely worth the mark. That's to say what you see. So length and cycle by, I'm going to put 0 0.1 seconds, but if you put like there's fewer heartbeats per minute or it's a slower heart rate, well, that means the same thing, doesn't it? So you're going to get credit there. Okie doke. The ventricle contraction. Can you see the ventricle contraction is now takes a little bit longer? Not much longer, but here it's like less than 0 0.1 of a second. Now it's greater than 0 0.1 of a second. So ventricle contraction time has increased slightly and ventricle diastole this is the t wave that is also taking a lot longer isn't it Okay, so in this first one, ventricle diastole, if I look at the T wave, which is from here to here, about 0.2 of a second, and now it's 0.123 of a second, much longer. That's B, that's what it's doing. Okay, with reference to trace C, describe the effect of fibrillation and heart activity. And state one likely effect on the patient. I love that question. One likely effect with the patient if their heart rate was like this. <laughs> if that was actually happening. Um, okay, two. I've actually forgot what the question was already. Uh, describe the effect of fibrillation on the heart activity. Okay, so what basically, what is the heart activity there? The heart activity is that we have small, irregular contractions. Or the idea that there's now absolutely no pattern whatsoever to heart activity. A potential cause of that for B, what will happen because of that? Well, I, I could look at it this way. I could look at it scientifically like, well, because of small irregular contractures not contracted together, uh, blood will not be pumped efficiently. Um, I could look at that another way, because if the blood's not being pumped efficiently, then the blood won't get back to the heart through the coronary arteries, so the heart muscle won't have enough oxygen and glucose to respire, won't be able to contract, and obviously that will cause a heart attack. I could look at this another way, if there's not enough blood getting around to any of those organs, that's very much going to cause death. Yes, death is an answer for one mark. Um, even loss of consciousness, because obviously if the blood's not going to your brain, Oh, I can't spell consciousness. Consciousness. Conscious. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. I hope you can appreciate it. I've tried to spell consciousness. Uh, loss of being awake. There you go. <laughs> That'll do, won't it? Um, yeah, I I'd be tempted to be talking about that because that's a very direct effect of a, of a fibrillation. Blood not being pumped efficiently. But obviously that effect will, of course, lead to not just heart attack, but all pretty much all organ failure, which obviously will then lead to death. Okay, dokie. There you go. That's test 17 or 16, whichever one it was. I think it's 17. I hope that was useful. Oh, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. Well, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, I am done. I am done. Uh, I'm just going to go over task 18 whilst I'm here and I'm recording. So, you know, um, if you've done this, great. Let's go over it. If you haven't done it, if you want to do it, well, it's on this video. So here we go. We have the classic pressure diagram now for the cardiac cycle. 
in state which chamber of the heart pressures the greatest and the greatest pressure changes occur? Uh, the answer to both is ventricles. The pressure is the greatest, because which chamber of the heart? So that doesn't include aorta. Aorta is a blood vessel, not a chamber. So is it either going to be ventricle or atrium? So for both, the pressure is going to be greatest in the ventricle. And the greatest pressure change is the ventricle. The ventricle pressure at some points is the same as the atria. But then when that ventricle starts to contract, the pressure, poof, all the way up here. So with reference to the figure above, explain what's happening at X and Y, and then we have to calculate the heart rate. So I'm just going to use this again. So if a, X is pointing at uh, where we, we've got the line, which is the aorta pressure, which is coming in here. And this line coming up here is the ventricle pressure. So the ventricle must have already started to contract. And that would have been caused by here, the atrioventricular valves closing because of that start of ventricle systole. So the pressure would increase, increase, increase until this point. Oh, it keeps increasing. The ventricle is still contracting all this time. But the real difference maker here is the pressure in the aorta suddenly starts to increase as well. So at X, that must be the moment that the semilunar valves open. And that allows the blood to flow a longer pressure gradient from the ventricle and into the aorta. And that is why the pressure in the atrial aorta then starts to increase. But it's also why the pressure in the ventricle starts to level off. It's still increasing because the ventricle is still contracting further and further. But that pressure starts to level off a bit. I promise the uh, tablet will catch up with me eventually. So if I keep following this on. So this point here, notice that everything, all the pressure starts to decrease again. So that's about the sort of time... When, uh, this, when the blood might start to go back into the ventricle. So th therefore here, this is where the semilunar valves close. And the pressure in the ventricle drops and drops and drops and drops and drops and drops and drops until point Y. Well, it keeps dropping. But at point Y, notice what's changing here as well. So now, yes, the ventricle's still dropping, but the difference here is we've got the line from the atria coming upwards. And at point Y, the pressure in the atria then drops suddenly again. What's been happening in the atria is the atria contracted here, and then the atria has actually entered diastole at this point. And at this very lowest point here, now it starts to fill with blood coming from the veins, coming from, because this is the left, this is all about the left side of the heart. So this is coming from the uh, pulmonary vein. So blood from the vein is moving into the atria down a pressure gradient, and it keeps moving up and up and up and up until this point, the suddenly that pressure decreases again. So that blood that was in the atrium from the vein must go somewhere else for the pressure to decrease. So at point Y, that is when the atrioventricular valves open. And because we're dealing with the left hand side of the heart, if, we, if it's very bad with the aorta, then obviously this would be the bicuspid valve. When the atrioventricular valves open. So that is very much a case of diastole. You know, we are now in atrial and ventricular diastole at the same time. So blood uh, from veins and therefore the atria flows down the pressure gradient into the ventricle and both the atria and ventricle are relaxed when that happens. So the last question on this one was just to calculate how many beats per minute. Uh, we are looking at an entire cardiac cycle there. So the entire cardiac cycle is taking 0 0.75 seconds. I'm just going to do my working. I can't remember if it was question B or not. Sorry if it's not. Um, I literally have no idea what the question number is. I'm going to call it B, not that it's showing on my tablet. So the entire one cardiac cycle is 0.75 seconds. 
So effectively the question is asking how many 0.75 seconds can I fit in 60 seconds? So to do that, take your 60 seconds, divided by 0 0.75, and that will give you your beats per minute. And I think the answer is 80. Feel free to check that on a calculator. Anyway, that's my lesson. That's all I'm doing. Thank you very much. Get in touch with any questions. Bye-bye.